Charlie says, always tell your mummy before you watch one of Grimm's videos, because he swears a lot. Hello lovelies. Life throws some weird juxtapositions at you at times. For example, notoriously conservative in terms of art and architecture, King Chuck just unveiled his new portrait, which is a radical departure from more conventional portraiture, and presents him in an unflatteringly realistic and wrinkly and old way, at least in terms of his face and hands. The hands especially look a bit skeletal <laughs> in some images, uh, while everything else is painted in shades of red. It's striking as a portrait. It's uh, interesting as a choice from within such a staid institution. And uh, dare I say it, uh, at risk of losing my small r republican status, it's actually quite good. <laughs> uh, it even has a little monarch butterfly hovering over his shoulder, which is a little on the nose, but it's a nice nod to, to King Chuck's appreciation of nature. And on the same day, we had the cover for the new Player's Handbook drop uh, for the new edition of D&D. &D. Uh, what do we get from the company that brought us Errol Otis, Ditizzoli, uh, Brom, that was a home and an incubator for the talents of Elmore, Coldwell, and too many others to name? A, a pastel mush, <laughs> just the same as... Things have largely been throughout 5th edition's time. And, and look, okay, if you want rage bait, there's plenty of other channels for that. I'm going to try and turn a bit more of an analytical eye towards this. Yeah, it, It's funny, when I studied communications as a qualification, it, it was considered a bullshit subject. But it's probably the qualification that I've had the most use out of post-education in both my personal and professional lives, but yeah, here we go. All right, well, let's consider the visual storytelling of previous player's guides or their equivalent. You know, the first couple of editions uh, of D&D &D we can forgive, I think. Art wasn't a major consideration or thing in a lot of the earlier wargaming spaces. Diagrams, charts and tables, these these were important, not so much art. And that first and sort of second printing of D&D, &D, it's fairly slapped together. It's a fairly amateur effort using whatever there was that was available. Um, and this ethos carried on to some extent even through later editions, you know, outsider art. The kind of thing you might scribble on your school workbooks between classes while listening to Metallica on your orange foam Walkman headphones. That that kind of sketchy, doodly, teenage imagination aesthetic was found in a lot of the earlier forms of D&D. &D. Uh, and that's still a kind of aesthetic. Uh, the aesthetic of zines, of punk rock, of do-it-yourself. And it kind of told you that you could do it yourself when it came to D&D, &D, when it came to role-playing. Um, and I think if it hadn't had that visual storytelling, maybe the hobby wouldn't have exploded as much as it eventually did. Now, BX's cover is a great example of visual storytelling by Errol Otis. It has some of that psychedelic 70s vibe. It has a magician showing a bit of leg. Uh, it's actually set in a dungeon, and you have treasure, a monster, what looks like a magic spear, and all of that stuff. It's all there in an attention-grabbing, brightly coloured piece that sets the tone and the expectation while still having character and being a little odd, which is kind of Otis's thing, I guess. Uh, the Redbox Basic Edition is probably the iconic piece of D&D art, uh, which is why there was such a stink about gender swapping the depicted character in a cheap and tawdry pandering exercise. It's Elmore who was synonymous with D&D &D, 
uh, for a long time, particularly the sex appeal that it had during the Dragonlance era, I guess, for many years. It's also a bit of an odd one as a cover, since it, it focuses in on a single fighter rather than a party, though the original sketch did have more of a full party standing nearby. Still, we have a through line from BX of action, a dragon, treasure, the combat. It's somewhere underground, and it invites us to imagine ourselves in the place of the faceless warrior. Intentional or not, that's a great way to hook people and draw them in and to have them imagine themselves in that position. The first edition AD&D book is a, a bit of a departure. The fight is over. The monsters are dead. Um, the party, which is depicted this time, is a little bit flat, but they're clearly discussing their next moves while the thief prize gems from the eyes of a ghastly statue. It's a different focus, but it is a focus that is familiar to anyone who's played the game, and it's not as well executed as some other pieces, but it is iconic again, and again invites us into the world, invites us to participate, to imagine ourselves as part of the group as they discuss what to do next. The second edition D&D cover is much better executed, and back to Elmore, I believe, but while it depicts charging on horseback, it doesn't really reflect the game quite as well. There's no dungeon here, there's no immediate combat. It's of higher quality, reflecting the larger budget available and the burgeoning availability of artistic talent, but it doesn't draw us in in the same way the first edition cover or the basic cover did, and it doesn't encompass the experience of D&D &D in the way that BX did. The third edition was much more graphical in nature. This was you know, the turn of the century, and we'd had iconic graphic-oriented covers from White Wolf at around that time. The books presented themselves as in-world items, leather-bound tomes or grimoires full of forbidden lore. It was very much the sort of visual zeitgeist at the time when it came to book covers and design, and it presented the books almost as in-world artefacts. You were invited to crack them open and to look inside to really see what was going on. Uh, these were secretive tomes. And inside you would find, in a lot of places, a sort of pen and parchment, sketchy aesthetic, or, or dungeon punk, or as it would come to be known. Yeah, this was a, a version of the game with a little less whimsy and which perhaps tried to take itself a little bit more seriously and that was reflected in the art. And the books were mostly presented as artefacts in the world and that was its hook to draw you in. Fourth edition reflects its own design choices in its art. We have exaggerated forms drawing clear inspiration from MMOs and the exaggerated weapons and silhouettes and so on of characters within those. But it doesn't have the cartooniness of, say, World of Warcraft. For our Player's Guide cover, we get a, a, a dragonkin warrior of some sort with exaggerated weaponry and a sorceress showing a little bit of skin, which takes us back to BX and Errol Otis. It ties in very much with the combat focus of the edition, but in this case, rather than anonymizing the player characters, it anonymizes the enemy, inviting us to consider who or what they might be facing and to put ourselves in that position. Still, it kind of stumbled that edition, uh, but the aesthetic definitely ties in with the design choices. The fifth edition's player's guide cover is more action packed than I remember though it is centred on some idiot trying to punch a giant with a glow stick. However, if we look at 5th edition in the context of the other editions, the illustration has no real weight or impact to it. The colours blend and bleed together. There's no definition, there's no contrast. It becomes muddied and forgettable. It's a mush, which is a common refrain I have whenever I review 5th edition material. And this problem gradually got worse and more pastel in shade throughout 5th edition. Flat, muddy, uninspired illustrations with no strong visual identity or language or character or action 
really, to them. And it got worse and worse as he went along. Which brings us to this new image. Everyone's looking the wrong way to either fight the kobolds or the dragon. The group might as well be the cast of friends posing in the fountain. It has that pastel, muddied absence of aesthetic that has plagued 5th edition. And it brings it directly through to the new edition, virtually without revision or change, just a slow evolution. But why, you might ask? Typically, these kinds of choices are very, very deliberate, and lots of people have input on what they're going to put on the cover, because that is the most important image of any book that you create. The cover of Redbox Basic is probably so iconic precisely because Gary didn't really know what he wanted and so kind of let Elmore do his thing whereas this looks like it was designed by a committee and one of the committee members seems to have been a very poorly prompted AI trained on a tween girl's autumnal wardrobe but the mediocrity is the point I think they're still trying to sell this as continuity 5e so they are selling the compatibility visually. It's a little disappointing because some of the revealed interior pieces are much better than the cover and suggest that they could have gone in a different direction if they wanted to, but I guess just not on the cover. It also might have been nice to see on the 50th anniversary some nods to the game's heritage, but alas, no. This is not a company any longer that will take risks or do something freakish or interesting. They're not interested in educating their audience, broadening their perspective or their horizons to other works of fantasy or great fantasy artists. They're about being inoffensive, familiar, safe. They're McDonald's where most RPG companies are greasy spoon cafes with some off-menu choices of various exotic things. You know, what do they call D&D in Europe? Le D&D. It's the same wherever you go. This is corporatized junk, and to be fair to them, that has worked very well during 5th edition. But as the hobby begins to contract again, and as the 5e wave that decides to remain hopefully starts to crave something different, better, more challenging, will serving them the same hazy mush serve them as well? Probably not. They'd probably be better off trying something more daring, more visually arresting and innovative. Uh, I got kind of hopeful looking at the deck of many things <laughs> illustrations, but I, I guess not. I forget the technical term for this, but there is a form of marketing for niche products. It's also a strategy uh, for, for dating on apps and websites, where you present yourself in a more extreme version of yourself or your product, so that you create uh, stronger, more polarized reactions. Where you can't compete on other terms, you can do this, and this nets you more interest from the group that have even the slightest interest and more more commitment and effort from them while scaring off tourists and browsers you know time wasters so it's a good way to build a loyal solid base for whatever product you've got is to make it somewhat polarizing so that you're screening out uh, a lot of time wasters and focusing on your core audience and that might have served them better this time around given the financial and so on environment that we're heading into anyway that's my insight probably wrong most artistic analysis is bullshit and the only people that can really tell you what they were thinking and what was going on are the artists that produced the piece but what do you think let me know below because that drives engagement i'm not actually interested in anything you have to say <laughs> or correct me where i got some game history wrong I had a late one, so my brain isn't exactly firing on all cylinders. Zang. My own dungeon with blackjack and hookers. A very simple and brutal 
print and fold pocket RPG for killing things, taking their stuff, engaging with nonsense, and spending your ill-gotten gains on ale and whores. No copyright or anything. Hack, share, upload, just link back to me as a courtesy. Available at all the usual places.